Well, we're going to have a little fun tonight because we're going to uh, get into some way off, you know, offbeat material. Um, uh, as we explore the scripture together, you've heard me from time to time emphasize Acts 17.11. And I'm going to suggest, especially tonight, that you put that at the, your notepads. Acts 17.11, as you are well aware by now, is where Luke reminds you not to believe anything Chuck Missler tells you but uh, rather to be like the Bereans in, on the one hand, to receive the word of God with all readiness of mind, but to search the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. And I love to cling to that scripture because, first of all, it will put you where you ought to be, that is, checking what the word says rather than any crazy scheme that I should surface. Uh, I also like that passage uh, because it helps relieve the responsibility off me as a teacher. I maintain that I'm not a teacher. I've read what James and some of the others say about teachers, and that's a little heavy, so I don't call myself a teacher. I, I duck that appellation when it's thrown at me. But rather, I regard myself as having a gift, perhaps, to stimulate you to get excited and interested and do your own study. So my real motive tonight, especially, will be to try to... Um, Stretch your horizons, broaden your viewpoints, uh, uh, or as Hal Lindsey sometimes accuses me of, blindfolding your prejudices. I love that phrase of his. He, 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 just, he used that once of me as a, uh, uh, perhaps a unique gift. The idea is, is that many of our problems in understanding the scripture are born of our own myopia, our own notions. Nothing uh, can be more disastrous than our own presuppositions and constraints. So, the main thing we're going to do tonight is we're going to go way off in left field. I'm going to share with you some things. Uh, those uh, uh, My critics often accuse me of this sort of thing, and tonight they'll be correct. I'm really going to go off in left field. My only excuse is that I think the um, side trip we're going to take will be stimulating, will broaden your horizons, um, and allow you to come back at the Scripture perhaps with a, a, a more refreshed point of view. I'm going to share with you some findings and theories and ideas that may not be correct, but will be useful, nevertheless, in showing us things that uh, uh, we uh, just presume without challenge. And um, so, obviously, I'm using as I'm using Joshua chapter 10. Uh, that is the long day of Joshua as my excuse. We read it last time. We were together, and we'll of course look at it again before the evening's over. But I'm really going to use that as an excuse to explore uh, some background, some, uh, some ideas that um, uh, have become very, very meaningful to me. In fact, frankly, in reviewing my old notes and references uh, that I used some years ago, reviewing them again for this session, I have to be candid with you. I just have been fascinated with uh, some of the things that have been available for some time. I'm just not sure they're, you know, uh, most of us is... is uh, uh, even as technicians in the field are probably not aware. And what has come out of all of this, for me at least, is to make real those people that lived so long ago. Um, you and I have a tendency to look back at the Egyptians or Canaanites or Amorites or Assyrians or whatever, uh, sort of artificially. I think most of us tend to view them as being so far back in time that they're quaint um unreal, stick figures written on monuments and, and so forth. I think when we begin to realize what they were up against, I think we're going to have a much greater sense of reality as to what they were faced with. Now, uh, uh, you know, everybody, when they read the scripture, uh, probably has their own unique little problems. In other words, as you go through the Bible and you see various things in the Bible, uh, some things that don't bother you may hang up somebody else. And something that some, hangs up your friend may not bother you. Everybody, I imagine, if we had a little contest, everyone, if I ask you, what, what's the thing that you have the hardest time with in the Bible? Uh, what's interesting, if we, if we collected those little slips of paper, you'd probably find a lot of different points of view. In other words, uh, some people would say, gee, I, I like the Bible, I understand, but boy, I really have a tough time with angels. I have a tough time relating to the reality of angels. Others of you may say, that's no problem, but I really have a trouble with Noah's flood, or this, that, or the other thing, or the six days of Genesis. That's, that'd be a popular item, I imagine, in most people's minds. But... Uh, and I'm, and, uh, uh, it's, uh, we all probably have our myopia or hang-ups, uh, with something in the scripture that we believe because God says so, but we may have a tough time visualizing it. Well, for you and I, in our modern 
scientific age probably have to admit to ourselves that we kind of have a tough time with the long day of Joshua. I mean, it's one thing for Jesus to walk along the shores of Galilee and heal a leper. We sort of can relate to a medical kind of miracle, um, I think. Most of us probably can. Uh, we can talk about um, um, winning certain battles with the Lord intervening or putting the enemy to confusion. Uh, there are many things that we can sort of deal with because they're perhaps in the psychiatric or medical or biological arena. Uh, and uh, But when we come to something as cosmic as the idea that the sun stood still, where Joshua needs more time during that day, so he prays to God to have the sun stand still, and it does. Well, we have kind of a hang-up with that. And may the commentators uh, try to work with the language and says, gee, son, be thou silent, which is one reasonable construction of the Hebrew. And that's neat if that was all it was said, but it's all the way through there. You know, it's clearly uh, some interesting things happened on that day. Um, we have a tough time because we can't really quite visualize the sun standing still. In fact, the quaint critics uh, like to point out that that was just an evidence of the myopia of the ancient writers, that because we know the sun doesn't move, it's the earth that's spinning. And so for that to happen, the earth has to stand still or slow down or something. And, of course, the fact that he tells the sun to stand still and the moon on that same day, because they're both visible, the sun over Gibeon and the moon over the Valley of Agilon, uh indicates that maybe Joshua wasn't so dumb. And we still speak of sunrise and sunset, so I don't think we'll quarrel with his uh, use of idiom. But obviously, the more exposure you have to the solar system or planetary movements and what have you, probably the more trouble you have coming to grips with the idea of the long day of Joshua. And by the way, your problem does not stop there, because there's also the thing that comes up later uh, in the sundial of Ahaz, where Hezekiah is given an extended lifetime, and the Lord, to prove it to Hezekiah that he heard his prayer and so forth, gives him a sign. He lets the shadow of the sundial go back ten degrees. And we have trouble with that for the same reason. Now there you can figure, well, gee, maybe he altered the atmosphere to alter the refraction of the sun to move. I mean, we can sort of maybe, you know, the idea of stopping the earth in its orbit or in its rotation on the spin axis is a little heavy. I mean, we can quickly visualize what would that happen to the earth if you slowed down its rotation for a little bit, let alone have it go backward or what have you. So most of us probably, whether we admit it to our pastor or not, uh, sort of skim through those passages figuring, well, uh, let's get on with the next story. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we don't like, we say, gee, the Bible's literal, it has no errors, and yet there's certain passages that have to be sort of a bone in our throat when our neighbor says, hey, do you really believe this stuff? And we staunchly say, of course, and yet they're probably a little hard-pressed to explain that. So it's in that spirit I want to share with you some things um, that you might find interesting. And this happens to be a very timely subject because we're here a lot about Halley's Comet these days. Um, it's interesting when you go back in history, when Halley's Comet passed near the Earth, how it was prominent in advertising and so forth. People, whenever Halley's Comet makes its pass, what is it, once every 76 years or some such thing, um, it's a big to-do, right? Well, uh, I can uh, t tell you candidly, except unless you're an astrophysicist or an astronomer, I think Halley's Comet's going to be a big fizzle because you're going to have a tough time finding it. And if you can see it, it isn't going to be too exciting uh, unless you're sending uh, something up there closer to get a better look at it. But this raises an interesting question that ought to be bothering you because as we study the ancient cultures, and I mean all of them, the Hindus, the Chinese, the Romans, the Teutons, the, the, uh, you know, and, 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 and what have you, we can't help but notice, and I'm going to take you through some examples, that they were preoccupied with the planets, really preoccupied with the planets. Um, and, uh, you know, we have uh, the city of Rome founded on the whole concept of Mars as the god of war. And um, we have the names of our, our, our uh, days of our week, the months of our calendar. Uh, but more importantly, the gods they worshipped, all these ancient cultures worshipped all kinds of gods with different names. But when you peel behind those names, you discover it's always Mars, Venus, the other planets that are operative as the gods they worship. Now, that ought to bother you. Not that they don't worship weird things. It's amazing what man will choose to worship. Okay. In fact, one of the most amazing things, to get a little bit sidetracked on our sidetrack here, is uh, <laughs> great intellectual minds who have a tough time accepting the Bible and Jesus Christ as the Son of God 
will then, after rejecting that, take up, and if you'll excuse the expression, the damnedest things to worship, okay? Um, uh, they get into the Eastern religions and they get into all kinds of bizarre substitutes. But don't let these odd things of the past blind you to the fact that the man and woman of the ancient col uh, uh, cultures almost universally around the earth for thousands of years was terrified of the planets by their various names. Now, you can put together a myth, a culture, a, a, a belief system, but it gets modified as time goes on. It gets watered down. It gets mixed up with other things. Why is there this consistent terror and um, yielding to the planets in those ancient... And to dramatize what I mean, those people didn't have telescopes. That didn't come in until 1610 or so, when Galileo invented the telescope. So we live in a day where we've got telescopes, binoculars. You can go to every toy store and pick up a, an instrument that one of the guys, as recently as a few hundred years ago, would give his left arm for. So we live in an enlightened age. NASA, man on the moon, the whole routine, right? Would you feel that you're more educated about the solar system than they were? Probably. Could you find Mars in the night sky tonight if your life depended on it? I don't think so. Or Venus. Maybe Venus because it's a little brighter and so forth. But Mercury, Saturn, Jupiter... Could you find them? And yet these people, without the education you have, lived in terror of them. That's ridiculous. But it ought to sort of put a flag in our mind that something doesn't compute. Hmm? Um, now, um, one of the reasons we have a problem is that we're victims, if you will, of a guy by the name of Immanuel Kant, who uh, wrote the general history and the nature of the nature and theory of the heavens in 1755. And Immanuel Kant, as a philosopher and a writer, proposed a concept that has been carried down throughout our culture to the present day. I would imagine some substantial portions of the greatest minds on the earth today in the Western civilization subscribe to the principles of Immanuel Kant and his basic concept is that the, that the solar system grew out of gas that congealed around planets and sun and so forth, and it, and it, it, it um, came together by natural causes. It's, this is part and parcel, if you were, of, uh, of the, old, the general flavor of evolution. Now, when we, sp say of ev when we speak of evolution, we mean biological, you know, the Darwin kind of thing, which is a, a biological thing, but even broader than that, the same concept uh, uh, is summarized in what is, would be called uniform uniformism. When we look up, in fact, you'll hear, you listen when you hear movies or newscasters, when they talk about that which is really certain, they talk about the sidereal movements by which time is reckoned. They take for granted, we all do, that the planets and their satellites and the sun and the stars are predictable, dependable, reliable. There's nothing as certain as the sun rising and setting and the Movements of the earth as it spins around its axis, that is, revolves around its axis, and then, um, I should say, excuse me, rotates around its axis, axis and revolves around the sun in its 365 and a quarter days journey throughout what we call the year. And as we talk about all these movements with the most amazing computers, they're precisely predictable. And so we have a, a presumption that it's always been that way. And all the theories and all the philosophies that you've probably been exposed to subtly and overtly imply uniformism. And that's a legacy we owe Immanuel Kant and others. And it's the basic premise upon which our general cultural background is uh, based. Except we've got some problems. If you do any current reading, it doesn't have to be too current, by the way. Some of these concerns go back, and some of them are very timely today. The whole concept of the origin of our solar system, as it's generally presented in the National Geographic or in our school textbooks doesn't deal with some very serious questions. We have nine planets that revolve around the sun. They have incredibly different densities. And it turns out the more you try to explain those densities, the more difficult they are because they don't fit any theory. 
to give you some idea of the variant, the, Saturn, which is a you know, huge satellite, has a specific gravity of 0.71. That is, if you had it here, it would float in water. Okay, and and there's others that are that are very very heavy. The, the variation is enormous. But more importantly, um, they all have different spin rates. If they evolve through some kind of initial initial bang or what have you, why are all, why are they all spinning it at different rates? Jupiter, one of the biggest, uh, moves in a forward direction in, in about 10 hours. Venus goes backward in about 242 days. See, the directions and the rates are dramatically different, and no one has. The more you try to study this, uh, by the way, Venus is also resonant with the with the Earth, which is kind of interesting with the Earth's orbit. Uh, almost, very close. In recent days, uh, the the uh, con- the Congress that uh, investigated the um, uh, extraterrestrial intelligence conference between the Soviet scientists and the U.S. scientists in 1971, that uh, the papers of which are fascinating reading, as these unbelieving scientists get together to speculate about life in the universe, they intrinsically argue about the very origin of life as we know it here in the pl- in the solar system. They point out its unique event with no statistical uh, basis. But the, one of the things they point out that they cannot explain. One of the big problems in cosmology is why do the planets have 98% of the angular momentum when the sun has 99% of the mass? As you start attacking these things mathematically, you come up with all kinds of insoluble problems. So the first thing that would catch our attention is the scientific theories that deal with cosmology um, have, all, have more problems than answers. So let's get that. The whole concept of a gaseous hypothesis of Kant raises the question why any of these things should be spinning in the first place, let alone in different rates and different directions. There's also the issue of diverse tilts. They all tilt at different angles and spin at different rates, except Mars and the Earth. The Earth happens to be about, um, anyway, about 24 degrees. Mars has uh, an angle. It's tilted about 24 degrees and the Earth about 23 and a half degrees. That's not precise of you in, 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 in later on in my notes. Uh, well, it's actually, uh, well, I'll find it exact if you want it more precise. I don't have the summary here. Um, why do some of the planets have satellites and others don't have any? These are all, the more you think on these subjects, the more trouble they are. Why are the eccentricities of the orbits and the semi-major axis, that is the line of apsides, and the ecliptic plane all different? Why are eight of the planets in one ecliptic plane and, and Pluto is quite diverse? Something that's just beginning to be analyzed in relatively recent years is the recognition that the orbits of all the planets have a resonance. There's a concept of orbital resonance. Now, in case you don't know what resonance means, if I have two tuning forks, say, that are both tuned to the middle C in the, in, on the piano, okay, and if I hit one, across the room, and it, you hear the tune, or the, the tone of middle C. If I have another tuning fork that's tuned to the same frequency, and if I listen closely, it'll start to resonate with the one that's across the room. There'll be sympathetic vibrations between the two because their physical properties are such as to make them resonant with one another. When you tune a radio, you simply are putting a circuit in the radio in resonance with the circuits that of the transmitter that's generating the broadcast. The whole concept of tuning a radio has to do with resonance. So the concept of resonance in physics has been understood for as long as we've had serious studies in physics. But what's interesting is it's only in recent years with our computers and our orientation to space travel that we're really starting to study the concept of orbits being in resonance. All physical bodies have mass and gravitational effects. When you have uh, 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 objects rotating in space around orbits and they come near each other, they influence each other. And so it's not surprising to find these orbits somewhat in resonance. Um, Saturn to Jupiter to Mars to Earth are in a ratio of 2 to 5 to 30 to 60. Or putting it another way, Jupiter, Mars, and Earth are 1 to 6 to 12. Now, something you may have noticed there, gee, Mars and the Earth are almost 2 to 1. I'm saying these are approximate, by the way. These aren't quite precise. One reason it hasn't been noticed in the past is that the ratios are not perfect. They're imperfect. But it's interesting that they're almost in resonance. And we're going to come back to the Mars-Earth orbit in a minute. Now, why am I getting into all of this? Well, the first point you should recognize is that our concepts of our solar system are frail. When you examine them closely, they don't stand up to scientific scrutiny. And so there's a lot, if you're in the field of cosmology, there's lots of dialogue and concerns about all of these things, and you'll find they have more questions than answers. 
This angular momentum thing may bore you to death, but let me tell you candidly among cosmologists, it's a really unsolvable problem. Now, you and I aren't scientists. We don't have computers at home that can handle celestial mechanics and so forth. Uh, most of us wouldn't know an aphelion or perihelion or perigee or something if it, our life depended on it. But i tell you what we can do. We can take a look at the moon through a telescope. Now, if you want to propose the idea that the solar system is orderly, smooth, constant, free of difficulties in its origin, you look at the moon and that poor guy has been beat up a bit. There are so many craters. There are so, there's so much scar tissue on that guy. He's been in some bad fights for a long time. No one can sell you that the, whatever you know instinctively by looking at that, you can tell it was, it is a victim of catastrophe, of buffeting, of things that always haven't been uniform and separated. If you fly coast to coast from LA to New York during the day rather than a night flight, You'll probably fly near Flagstaff, Arizona, and your pilot to uh, make conversation will point out to you near Winslow, Arizona, a thing they call the meteor crater. Okay, you probably have seen it. If you haven't, you will. It's a, you'll see it in postcards and texts. There is a moon-like crater in Arizona that clearly appears to be just exactly what the moon looks like. It looks like it's been hit by a meteor. Um, it's probably been a bolide rather than a meteor, but that's a technicality. Meteors are made of iron, nickel, and silicon, and they, they uh, are hard like rocks. They sometimes will burn up completely before they hit the earth, but in general, they're like rocks. A bolide is a, mater- is a meteor that is made of combustible material. When these things come into our atmosphere about 30,000 miles an hour, um, they tend to burn and explode. And uh, in uh, 1908 in Siberia, there was what most people, t- that some people call a comet or a meteor, but if you're technically correct, it was probably a bolide that was heard hundreds of miles away, maybe over a thousand miles away. It scorched forests for like over a hundred miles in distance. And, um, fortunately it was an uninhabited portion of Siberia, but there was all kinds of evidence and it's, it's been much write, written about if you're in this, uh, uh, interested in this sort of thing. So, um, what am I leading up to? Well, uh, you've probably been wondering, yes. Well, <laughs> you and I are victims of uniformitarianism in effect. On the other hand, if we look around the earth, we'll discover that there's all kinds of uh, evidences that the theories we've been gro- we've grown up with don't fit. One of the examples, and I'm going to give you a list of some paradoxes that people have been pondering, people who have nothing else to do but ponder these things, is there's a lot of evidence that the earth at one time had a universal climate. You've probably read about the... Uh, uh, prehistoric animals that have been encased in the ice in Sam- Siberia that have even food in their digestive tracts, which prove they were not only frozen, but frozen very quickly, and they didn't decay, in other words. And uh, there's evidence that at one time the Arctic areas have evidence of a, of a tropical climate. And there's all kinds of theories about how that happened, that there was once either a universal climate or the Earth rotated differently or what have you. But that's an enigma. More importantly, for your interest in mine, there's something else that's worth noting. And that is that every ancient culture had a 360-day calendar. The Mayans, the Aztecs, the Chaldeans, the Hebrews, the Chinese, the Hindus, the Egyptians, the Carthaginians, the Etruscans, the Phoenicians, the Teutons, all had 360-day calendars with 30 days per month, implying that the moon also rotated on a 30-day basis, up until about 701 B.C., Something happened for, from, uh, from about 2500 B.C., which is the earliest reliable records we have, to about 701 B.C., all ancient cultures seemed to get along pretty well with a 360-day calendar, 12 months of 30 days each. Something happened, apparently, in 701 B.C. that caused all these calendars to need adjustments. Each culture addressed the problem differently. Rome was founded about 70, 750 B.C., and maybe as a result of some of the things we're going to talk about. And the second emperor, first emperor is kind of a brigand, but the second emperor um, adjusted their calendar by adding five days to each year to get 365 and a quarter days. They also added a leap year subsequently and what have you. The Hebrews did something else. They added a month every five or six years, intercalary month. 
the Phoenicians did their trick, the Etruscans, theirs. Each calendar dealt with the the inadequacies of a 360-day calendar after 701 B.C. different ways. Why? Now, it's interesting. If you read the rabbinical literature, the Talmud, the Mishnah, these kinds of things, they all wonder why Hezekiah added the month the way he did. And he did it in kind of a strange way, and all the rabbis argue why he did it the way he did. What's fascinating is no one asked, why did he have to do it in the first place? Why wasn't that 360-day calendar that had served them well for so long no longer valid? Something else that is observed, and that is that if we examine the ancient records in Babylon, we discover that there's four naked eye planets visible in their little inscriptions, not five. There's also some suggestions, but it's inconclusive, that the Earth rotated the other way around. This comes to do with some star maps that are found there and things, and the implication from some of the sketches is that the sun rose in the west and set in the east, which is a little disconcerting. There's all kinds of evidence on the Earth that the polarity of the Earth has reversed. There's iron deposits and other things which suggest more than once the polarity of the Earth has changed. Now, uh, what am I getting at? Well, there is a book which is probably wrong but fascinating reading that was published in 1950. The title of the book was called Worlds in Collision by a writer by the name of Emanuel Velikovsky. And you can find this book in most secular bookstores. He's not a believer. He's not a biblically, he's not a biblical believer. And, uh, um, and so I, I, you may say, gee, why am I recommending a non-Christian book? Well, only for one reason. It's interesting reading. This guy published a book in 1950, that at first was laughed at by many of the, the classical scientific establishment. But as, as 30 years have gone by, you'll discover there are me- increasing numbers of serious articles about the validity of his theories. His particular hypothesis is probably wrong, but his awareness of the problems and his unearthing of facts is staggering. His theory to explain all this is that there was a comet that passed near the Earth more than once, several times, And this comet ultimately gets captured by the solar system and becomes the planet Venus. Why he picks Venus is not important. He just, that's the missing planet in his mind. He points out though that Venus in the the comet in the sky would be visible to the naked eye and has horns and sort of a tail and gives rise to calf worship, not only in Egypt but also in India and elsewhere. That's still with us today in a sense. Um, and what he, the main thing he does, his basic premise is that the Earth was subject to catastrophes of, of a solar, of a cosmological kind, and at recently enough to be recorded in the memory of man in terms of his history and his legends and his myths. And what he does, he of course takes the Bible as one of the better records of what happened, but only, only as a non-believer, bear in mind. He is fascinated, with, he primarily focuses on the exodus of Egypt, and tries to explain much of what happened there by means of the first pass of this comet. But he also addresses the long day of Joshua as the recap you know, of some 50 years later. And he picks 52 years for certain reasons. We're going to find some other reasons why it may not have been quite that far. There's some dating issues. Um, but the main point is, is that he, in exploring this, discovers and documents the legend of the long night among the Mayan Indians. The legend of the long night in China, all dated roughly the same time as Joshua's long day. And so even though you need not buy his particular hypothesis, what he does do is help substantiate the reality of some bizarre events on the planet Earth. Now, um, he gets into this issue of Friday the 13th. It's Velikovsky that points out that the reason Friday the 13th is unlucky is that the 14th of Nizan, when the Hebrews... Uh, had the, what we'll call the first Passover. The 14th of Nisan in the Hebrew calendar starts at sundown. Their day starts at sundown. The night that the death angel went through Egypt was the evening of Friday the 13th for the Egyptians. Very unlucky. And gets codified. Yeah. <laughs> and gets codified throughout Gentile history. Why? That's why Friday the 13th is unlucky. And Velikovsky, by doing his, this laborious research in the myths and legends of all the cultures he could get his hands on, uh, uh, you know, comes up with all this stuff. He points out the 52-year period between Exodus and the uh, long day of Joshua and links that to the Jubilee year. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that that's valid. just interesting that he, he sees behind us. Now, I'm not here to sell Velikovsky's hypotheses. 
because he has some real problems in my mind explaining how a comet could select only the firstborn in Egypt to die. <laughs> he does point out that as you pass near these bodies, they have magnetic fields that tend to collect debris. And as we pass near them, we pass through meteor fields. And it's not surprising to have our passbys accompanied by meteor showers. And that explains how these armies were wiped out and all that sort of thing. He's got a bit of a problem with Joshua 10 because the marksmanship was dynamic to have these meteors only kill the Canaanites and not hit one Israeli. So uh, now you, he probably, I forget whether he says it, but I'm sure he ascribes some of that just to editing and so forth. So fine. Uh, that's his view. And of course, this whole idea of being a, predict, prophet, a prophetic record, that these things were predicted by prophets and recorded, is something that is glossed over. From our point of view, our, we're going to see that God intervenes on behalf of his people, and we're going to be just flabbergasted as to how. Now, before we uh, get into some of this, I would like to highlight some of the things the Bible says that may surprise the cynic on these things. Uh, I think we have looked at Psalm 19 before. I'd like us to turn to Psalm 19. Did we mention this before, the last time we met, Psalm 19? The sun, the tabernacle for the sun? Uh, if not, let me just, if, if, bear with me if it's a repeat. But I'd like you to turn to Psalm 19 and hear what the biblical writer has to say. One of the amazing things you're going to discover before we're through this evening is that the Bible is not only more accurate than secular history, the Bible will describe things that you and I regard as figurative language, and they're not. They're eyewitness accounts of what really happened. But uh, first of all, a little broader view, let's take Psalm 19, verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. And we can uh, take that as a departure to study the Maseroth, that is the, the, the zodiac, but in Hebrew terms. And when we do that, we discover that it lays out the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a bizarre idea, but a, a subject for a whole other evening. But also we should not be surprised to see the heavens declare the glory of God as he deals with the nation Israel. And we're going to see that before the evening's over. But the psalmist goes on and says, Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. So your study of the heavens is not misplaced. Psalm 19 suggests you do that. In fact, he says, there is no speech nor language where their voice, that is the voice of the heavens, is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth. There's probably a theory of gravitation there if you like, but let's go on. And their words to the end of the world, in them, that is in the heavens, he hath set a tabernacle for the sun. In other words, a dwelling place for the sun. Which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of heaven and a circuit unto the ends of it. And there's nothing hid from the heat thereof. Well, I won't digress into the second law of thermodynamics and all that relative to that. But what is interesting is the Bible says that the sun moves from one end of heaven to the other. And you will probably encounter people who chuckle at that and say, see how quaint. This is a victim of the Ptolemaic cosmology. Ptolemy argued that the sun revolved around the earth. And of course, we're smarter than that today. We're the beneficiaries of Copernicus some many thousands of years, some, well, more than a thousand years later, uh, pointed out that the earth is going around the sun and the planet, all the planets have orbits around the sun. And uh, Copernicus, uh, incidentally, who was a uh, clergyman, um, sold that, I, well, had a tough time selling that idea. But the point is that we're, we're, we have what's called a Copernican view of the solar system, which, of course, is astronomically sound. And this, of course, is an anachronism. It obviously is a victim of the Ptolemaic cosmology. Well, not really. It just says that the circuit of the sun is from one end of heaven to the end of it. And if we not, don't look at our solar system, but the galaxy, <coughs> we recognize that the sun moves in a 25,000-year kind of orbit around our, milk, our galaxy. The rest of it, you see what we call the Milky Way. <coughs> and uh, so this is accurate. Now, something else I discovered, much to my amazement, before Ptolemy, the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Hebrews also recognized that the planets revolve around the sun. There's all kinds of indications of that. So this idea of the Ptolemaic cosmology is a naive point of view, it turns out. Well, I don't want to spend more time here, uh, but it might be useful to take a look at um, Job. The book of Job is probably the oldest book in the Bible, probably published by Joseph when he was in Egypt. 
<coughs> and of course, interesting to the Hebrews, as they increasingly were put under taskmasters, the whole idea of suffering, why do the righteous suffer, that all is quite consistent with the, the era in which Joseph uh, lived as they gradually, uh, when the Amorite kings took over Egypt and, and increasingly, uh, you're going to discover the Amorites, by the way, are the source of anti-Semitism and the slavery idea, and, and the subjugate, when they took over Egypt, subjugated the Hebrews. The 600 years of Amorite power in Canaan was, was finally broken at the Battle of Beth Horon in Joshua chapter 10. So there's a lot going on there. Abraham, when, uh, when God prophesied all this to Abraham, he pointed out to Abraham that after 400 years they would return to, uh, to Canaan, and, and, but they couldn't until the, sin, the iniquity of the Amorites was full in Genesis 15. But we might take a look at Job because it's kind of a provocative book if you're interested in cosmology because all through Job we have some interesting, interesting passages. You might turn to, to Job chapter 9. And um, he says all kinds of things. Um, he says in verse 6, or let's take verse 5, uh, it, it, it speaks of, um, uh, it, it, He it is who removeth the mountains, and they know not, who overturneth them in his anger. Have you ever seen a mountain overturn? We see them shake a lot, maybe, right? A few landslides here and there, maybe a volcano or two. We don't see them turn over, do we? So that must be just figurative language, perhaps. Verse 6, who shaketh the earth out of its place, the pillars of it to tremble, who commandeth the sun, and it riseth not, and sealeth up the stars, and who spreadeth out the heavens, and, and treadeth upon the waves of the sea, who maketh Arcturus, Orion, and the Pleiades, and the chambers of the south, who doeth great things past finding out, yea, and wonders without number. Job is raising some interesting questions here, cosmological issues, if you will. Um, uh, there's more of this, but let's just get a little more... Um, uh, you know, one step further. Let's turn to chapter 26. Job in chapter 26, um, verse 7, he stretcheth out the north over empty space. Oh, really? No turtles or backs of uh, Atlas or these quaint ideas that we encounter in the old cultures? He hangeth the earth upon nothing. Does that sound contemporary to you? That's kind of an amazing insight for a guy that lived at the time of Joseph, perhaps, in Egypt, certainly uh, before the Torah was written. Um, he bindeth up the waters in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not torn under them, and, and so forth. Uh, verse 11, the pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. He divideth the sea with his power, and by his understanding he smiteth through the proud. And by his spirit he hath garnished the heavens, and his hand hath formed the crooked serpent. I wonder what the crooked serpent is. Is that Scorpio? Uh, it could be. If we get to chapter 38 of Job, and I'm just sampling here to give you some flavors because uh, uh, it's interesting to reconcile this with what we're starting to find out about the, 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 the world. Um, uh, chapter 38, I mean, uh, yeah, chapter 38 um, raises some questions and are some fascinating questions. I'll have a tough time uh, um Focusing on just what I want to pick out of this. Let's take verse, verse 31. He's, he's raising the question. God says, Canst thou bind the sweet influence of the Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Canst thou bring forth the Maseroth in its season? The word Maseroth means the zodiac, but it also some evidence that it was the ancient Hebrew word for the planet Mars, which is a whole other subject. As we get to chapter 40 and 41, I won't take the time now, but you're going to discover in chapter 40 and 41, two strange creatures are mentioned. Okay? The Leviathan... Uh, in uh, chapter 41, and there's a behemoth or a, another kind of strange creature mentioned in chapter 40. And you'll find people say that this is a hippop hippopotamus maybe and a crocodile. But let, I won't take the time now because we want to get on to other things. But if you read that, you're going to have a tough time reconciling that to either a hippopotamus or a crocodile. The language is much more bizarre. And I'm going to suggest to you after tonight, you go back and read that and see if they don't correspond, perhaps, with what you'll learn tonight, that it might be Mars and Mercury. Mars and Mercury. So, uh, now, to give you a further insight, let me point out, we talk about all the ancient cultures worshipping the planets. The Phoenician word for Mars was Baal. The Phoenician word for Venus was Ashtoreth. Mars was the god of war to whom you gave child sacrifices. Ashtoreth was the god of fertility to whom you had sexual orgies and things to get the crops and all that stuff. But we, while we study from time to time, our studies of the Bible bring us in touch with these idolatrous cultures, 
don't lose sight of the fact that there's some reason why they're all tangled up with the planets. Well, enough of this. What am I finally driving at? I suppose you've been asking. Not yet. I want to give you a few other things. <laughs> I don't want to pick on any one culture. Part of what I want to get across, see, we could pick on the Canaanites and they were idol worshippers. Let's take a quick survey. Let's look at, look at Greece. Some of their ideas retract back to a mathematician by the name of Thales who lived about 640 to 546 B.C. And the main gods that, that uh, they worshipped were Ares, who was a name for Mars. And interesting how, if you study the ecliptic and how interesting the first, in, remember that in March is called the first point in Ares, the constellation Ares. But it may be a pun because Ares was also, the different spelling, the same pronunciation was a name for Mars. Aphrodite was a name for Venus. Zeus was a name for Jupiter. Apollo met Mars originally, but later gets changed to be the sun. Uh, Hermes was Mercury, Kronos was Saturn, and so on. Again, their key gods in Greece were named after planets. Hmm? Interesting. Let's turn to Rome, 750 B.C. The first thing that may strike us, because when we get to 701 B.C., I'm going to develop some things that I'm going to suggest that there was a major catastrophe on the earth that changed the calendar. Rome was founded about 750 B.C. It's on the river Ty- uh, on the, on the uh, Tiber. Why is it 15 miles inland and not on the coast? It would be a good port, right? Everybody wonders why it was Rome founded on the Tiber 15 miles upstream. It's where you'd put it if you were afraid of getting hit with 100 or 200 foot tidal waves. Okay. Rome was founded with a preoccupation of the god of Mars. We still hear the term martial arts, right? The god of war. Um, Aprilia is a name for Venus. Maius was actually named for Mercury. Juno for Jupiter. And so the months are named and so on. Um, now, um, and their, their calendar started in March 21st, the, the, uh, the first point in Aries and all that, the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, vernal equinox. Later, under Janus, in 364 A.D., the correction, 364, I think it's B.C., it gets to change to January 1. But for a while, March is the key month of the year. A lot of the other cultures are going to pick October. October 25th is a key date. March 21 is a key date. Why October? It gets all to do with Halloween. I'll come to that. The Teutons in North Europe, the Teutonic ideas, named the seven days of the week that you and I use. Sundag was the day for sun. Moondag, D-A-E-G, if you will, uh, is uh, obviously Monday. Tywes, T-I-W-E-S, Tywes Day, is the name, they're a Teutonic name for Mars. Because you've got the sun, the moon, and Mars next. I wonder why. Then Odin's Dag, or Woden's Dag, becomes Wednesday for Mercury. Thor's Day, Jupiter. Thursday. Freya talk was their name, the Teutonic name for Venus. And of course, uh, Saturday for Saturn. So the days of the week that you and I use go back to the Teutonic naming of our days. I wonder why. And why is there Halloween October 31? There's a whole thing there about the Druids. The Celtic year ended it October 31st. And they had bonfires and it was a bad luck time because of fears that surrounded October. And, um, there's a, you can compare that with the Phoenician uh, themes of Baal and Ashtoreth and all of that. Now, um, some of this Vilikovsky take, takes on, but what I want to do now is share with you something that, again, may be wrong, but it's interesting. So just be patient with me. Uh, three guys uh, published some papers back about ten years ago, a little over ten years ago, a guy named Donald Patton, Ronald Hatch, and Lauren, Dr. Lauren C. Steinhauer. And I want their ideas just to stretch your minds. I'm not here to sell them, but to give you a flavor of their backgrounds. Patton was a geographer, historian, and author, and has done some writing about creation of the biblical flood. Ronald R. Patch was a mathematician, a physicist, and orbital analyst. He wrote the computer programs for developing satellite-based navigation. He worked with the Applied Physics Lab, John Hopkins University, for the Navy Satellite Program, worked for Boeing and Magnavox and others in satellite you know, computer models of, of, of orbital mechanics. Dr. Lawrence E. Steinhauer is a uh, theoretical mathematician. He taught aerodynamics and, math- and orbital mechanics and applied mathematic- mathematics at Harvard, MIT, and the University of Washington. So these guys are kind of, you know, uh, neat dudes. Um, uh, so they have a hypothesis. They've done some studies, and they have a hypothesis that may be wrong, but I think it's worth sharing with you. They have 
noticed all the things I've mentioned so far, and they're obviously well aware of Velikovsky's work, but they have a different view, and they have access to different information than Velikovsky did. They notice that if they study the Bible and the Talmud and the Mishnah and the ancient Hebrew records, that in the Bible one can identify seven major what they call catastrophes. This includes Sodom and Gomorrah, the Exodus. Incidentally, they separate the flood as a special situation. I won't get into that right now. But the... uh, uh, and of course, um, um, they start, actually what they do is they start with the days of Peleg, the Tower of Babel, Sodom and Gomorrah, some catastrophes that occurred during the days of Job, the Exodus, the long day of Joshua, some things that happened in the days of Deborah and Samuel, two things that happened in the days of David, Elijah, Joel Amos, and, and the big thing, the big one that we want to talk a little bit about is on Isaiah, uh, during the time of Isaiah in 701 BC. Now, when they look at all of this and they start analyzing it, they discover some interesting things. They discover, first of all, that all of these things appear to have occurred in either March or October, which is kind of interesting, October 25th or March 20th or 21st. They also discover that there's about 108 years or some multiple of that between each one of these. And they said, gee, that's, that period is kind of interesting. And to get to a long, to make a long story short, uh, they, oh, they notice a couple of things, uh, that uh, three of them occur on March 20th, 21st, four of them occur on October 25th out of the major seven. Two of them occur in the 8th century B.C., two of them occur in the 15th century B.C., and two of them occur in the 20th century. So they're fascinated by the fact they seem to, some of them, you know, they seem to occur in pairs and yet separated by multiples of 108 years. Now, I'm going to sort of get ahead of the story, but so you can see where I'm headed. They notice that Mars has an orbit of 687 days, the Earth 365. They're not quite two to one. They have built a computer model, which if correct, goes to explain most of what we're going to talk about tonight. They believe that there's good evidence to suspect that Mars was originally on a two-to-one orbit to the Earth. Take the Earth at 360 days, Mars at 720, and overlap the orbits so that Mars, the orbit of Mars would intersect the orbit of the Earth every March and October. But it would be two-to-one. It would thus intersect the Earth every 54 years, but not necessarily close by. And when they go through this model, they notice that on a couple of cases, it would pass very closely. Um, going back to the days of Job, it would come within 120,000 miles. The Earth is about 200. Well, to give you some feeling here, let me back up. Uh, Mars, furthest distance from the Earth would be about 210.7 million miles. It's way, way out there. The Earth is about 240,000 miles um, from from the Earth. The Earth, to give you some feeling, is is at perihelion. That is the point. It's closest to the sun. It's about 90,700,000 miles, about eight minutes by the speed of light. When it's furthest from the sun, called aphelion, perihelion is when it's closest to the sun, aphelion is furthest from the sun, it's about 93.7 million miles. In other words, about three million miles difference from 90.7 to 93.7 uh, million miles. Mars would come as close as 81,900,000 miles, and it was closer to the sun than the Earth, certain times, and go way further out, 210, 210.7 million miles at its aphelion. But it crosses the Earth in two places, the orbits do, in March and October. As you can probably gather, from time to time, Mars would pass very close to the Earth. How close? Well, the days of Job, about 120,000 miles at its nearest point. During the days of Exodus, 60,000 miles on an outside flyby. In the long day of Joshua, about 70,000 miles on a northern polar orbit. We'll come back to that. In the days of Deborah, about 150,000. Samuel, 150,000. David, 200,000 and 120. Elijah, 150,000. Joel Amos, about 120,000. In in the days of Isaiah, 70,000. Now, when something like Mars comes close, that close to the Earth some impressive things could happen. Um, First of all, you and I may not realize that there are crustal tides on the Earth. We know there's water tides by the moon and the sun and so forth, mostly the moon, because it's closer. And they're about two or three inches max. If Mars was within 70,000 miles past of the Earth, you would have crustal tides of more than 85 feet. That tends to be a little rough on buildings, on walls of cities. Now we're going to discover that the ancients expected this. They didn't know how bad it would be, 
but they knew that about every 108 years something might happen. And they even planned their battles that way. When the Assyrian army camps outside Jerusalem, there's some evidence to believe they were hoping there'd be a catastrophe to bring the walls down. What they didn't know is a bolide would wipe 185,000 of them out, if a bolide is the explanation of the angel described in, in, the, in the scripture. Um, one of the theories that I'm obviously leading up to is when Mars, let's say I forget which way it is, if it leads, if it leads, if it leads the earth, it pick, it loses energy, gives energy to the earth. If it lags, it picks up energy. In other words, there's an energy transfer between the orbit of Mars and the orbit of the earth when they come near each other. And it is believed by these scientists, they have the most data of the most recent one, which is 71 BC, that at that pass, the last of these seven, it, there was enough energy transfer to shorten the Mars orbit from 720 days to 690. There's still three days between then and today. Something else happened. They have some theories, but they're not sure. The Earth went from 360 days to 365 and a quarter. So the, the calendar adjustment they attribute to the near pass of Mars in the days of Isaiah, where all these calendars all over the world changed. That raises a question of, gee, if there's, that also involves several things with the Earth. Not just the orbit changing, but it also involves the spin axis changing, the location of the poles changing, and uh, and such. Uh, there's a change in axis. It changes the number of days per year. Some field reversals. Um, and um, um, now let me give you a little feeling for. Um, well, let me let me focus first of all on on uh, AD, uh, on uh, BC 701. At the time we're talking about, we have a number of interesting eyewitnesses. Rabshakeh, Sennacherib, Shebna, Micah, Habakkuk, Hezekiah, Manasseh, and Isaiah. And if you go through the scriptures and pick up the language out of particularly Habakkuk chapter 3, Psalm 46, um, Isaiah 36, and so on and so forth, you hear them speak of the mountains melting, being uprooted and moved out of their place. As you read that, as you and I read those passages, we call it figurative language, poetry. And, and we ascribe to much of what Habakkuk says in chapter 3 as just being literary. What will shake you up after understanding the orbital mechanics of what could, what could be the explanation for all this, they're describing eyewitness accounts of the last of these 70,000 mile passes. Um, it might be uh, before. Let's see. Before I get into that, let me let me give you some more facts. Um, the um, the the current perihelion of of uh, of um, well, let's see. I'm not sure if all these statistics mean a lot to you. Maybe I should get off this. Um, we're going to get into discussions a little bit here of the spin axis and so forth. One of the things that's interesting. Uh, Steinhauer, Hatch, uh, Patton and Hatch predict that if this happened on the Earth, it also probably happened on Mars. That is an adjustment of the spin axis and those kinds of things. Because it's, it turns out that Mariner 9, pictures from Mariner 9, shows a number of 200 mile, square mile plates on the Earth, on, 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 on Mars that have a number of colored lines. And one of the theories to explain the colored lines is that it's captured, captured frozen dust and it gives rise to the theory that Mars's orbit shift uh, the uh, axis shifted at least four or five times maybe six or seven times in its history the six or seven intrigues me because of the seven passes that uh, hatch and and this uh, had had predicted um, maybe it would be useful to take a look at Habakkuk chapter 3 Back at chapter 3. If nothing else, it'll be useful because it'll let you find Habakkuk. Page 953 in your new Schofield. Okay. Um, as you read through this, it may be just figurative language of a, of a prophet that's in prayer and in, in, and, in, and in praise and so forth, but it's kind of interesting to see the language of Habakkuk, who lived, by the way, about the 7th century B.C., and he's praising God, and verse 3 says, God came from Teman and from the Holy One from Mount Paran, Shelah, 
His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise, and his brightness was like the light, and he had horns coming out of his hand, and there was and, and there was the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence, and the burning coals went forth at his feet, and he stood and measured the earth and beheld and drove asunder the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered, and the perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction, and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea, that thou didst ride upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation? Thy bow was made quite naked, according to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word. Um, and, he, and he goes on like this. Uh, the mountains saw thee, and they trembled. The overflowing water passed by, and so on. The sun and the moon uh, stood still in their habitation. At the light of thine arrows they went, at the shining of thy glittering sp uh, spear. Thou didst march through the land in indignation, and, and didst thresh the nations in anger, and so on. This is, this is Habakkuk. Um, uh, it sounds like he may have been an eyewitness is the suggestion, okay? If you read Micah chapter 1, we won't take the time now. Um, in chapter 7, 6, and elsewhere, you'll find that Micah makes reference to catastrophes in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, Exodus, and the long day of Joshua before in, in talking about uh, a, 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 a situation that he's facing there, and he wrote approximately the 8th century B.C. But you might turn to Psalm 46. We all know Psalm 46. We, find, we encounter it from time to time. But in this spirit, it's kind of interesting to see the, the uh, prayer of the psalmist here. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Hey, that's not your everyday worry, is it? <laughs> though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Hey, you can talk about volcanoes and stuff, but it doesn't come close to what he seems to be afraid of. There is a river, the streams thereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and she, and she shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The nations rage, and the kingdoms were removed, excuse me, were moved. He uttereth his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow. He cutteth the spear asunder. He burneth the chariot with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. There are these kinds of passages in the Psalms. And you read these, well, say it's a little flowery language, maybe a little, you know, poetic license. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe that's written to a people who had something to sweat. Now, um... Uh, we could uh, go through more of these things. Uh, Isaiah 13 is a good chapter. Um, in the uh, maybe we, uh, let's not let's not uh, shortchange this. This is uh, as long as I took you to Vilakowski and and uh, the the Steinhauer book. Let's not shortchange the the more reliable record, namely the Word of God itself. So let's just take sort of a a swing through. I, let's talk to Isaiah a little bit. We could go into others, into Micah and what have you. But let's take Isaiah. Turn to chapter 13. Okay. And just sort of hear Isaiah a little bit. Uh, chapter 13, verse 4, The noise of a multitude in the mountains, as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of the nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of battle. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. Now, this could be, of course, prophetic in terms of the end time, or it might be, and maybe it's double, both. In other words, maybe it's the end times, maybe it's cosmological, or maybe it's both. And um, uh, it speaks of the day of the Lord, of course. Uh, we get down to uh, verse 13. Uh, Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of its place. Oh, really? You mean the orbit's changed? Yeah. And the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and, and in the day of his fierce anger. And, uh, and on he goes. Uh, we might turn to chapter um, uh, 24. Let's turn to chapter 24 of Isaiah. Um, interesting verse that opens chapter 24. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. Now that might be future. That might be, you know, a revelation correlated kind of verse. Or maybe it had something to do with the Tower of Babel or maybe several. Um, we can skim on here, but let's just pick it up about verse 18. And shall come pass on that day that he that fleeth from the noise uh, of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare, for the windows of the from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. 
The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is thoroughly dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. Now, this might refer to, you know, end time stuff. No question about it. But notice verse 20. And the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a booth and the transgression thereof um, shall be heavy upon it and it shall fall and not rise again. And it shall come to pass in that day the Lord of hosts shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high. And this is obviously end time in many ways. The earth shall reel to and fro. How interesting. Does that sound like a wobble, like an adjustment in the precession of the earth? There's evidence that the latitude of Jerusalem has changed at least five, maybe 12 degrees over the last several thousand years. And one of the explanations is a shift of the poles, shift of the precession, a shift of the location of the poles, and a change in the spin axis. There's about a five-minute difference in the day, by the way, if that really bothers you. No wonder the days seem shorter today. Um, oh, can we can look at uh, chapter 28 and um, pick up a few things. Verse 2, Behold the Lord like a mighty and strong one, who like a tempest of hail and destroying storm, like a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with a hand, and goes on. Um, well, there's, there's more of this. We One more, 34. Chapter 34 might be uh, an interesting stop by as we sort of swing through this. Uh, you might look at verse 4 of chapter 34, Isaiah. On uh, all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together like a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down, and like a leaf falleth from the vines, which, uh, like a, a falling fig from the fig tree. These, of course, are possibly, very likely, end time, day of the Lord uh, uh, prophecies on the one hand. On the other hand, they may also have had a more local fulfillment than either one of us have ever suspected. Okay? Now, getting back to the um, the idea of um, this Mars near pass, uh, I want to dramatize that a little bit for you. If Mars comes that close, there's a perturbation, obviously, of the Earth's orbit. There's an energy transfer. And there's two kinds of opportunities. With the, if the Mars is a little ahead of the Earth, getting at the junction point, or a little after the Earth. And especially if it's a polar orbit, it comes over the North Pole, it really alters things. And so that... Uh, when you go through the orbital mechanics, it explains something like 30 to 45 days loss in one case, and uh, uh, on, on the Mars case, and the Earth, three to four days. And that explains, incidentally, the Mars going from 720 down to 690. There's still three days, because today at 687, there's the supposition that it's also entangled with Jupiter in some respects. What we see is the solar system, after it's settled down and gotten in balance, what the history of the Earth may still have record of is while it was still going through some adjustments. And that's really what uh, uh, Patton, ha uh, Hatch, and Steinhauer suggest. Reversal of geomagnetic fields. Uh, severe crustal tides, I've mentioned that. Severe tidal waves. Um, and a wobble, of course, or a change of precession of the spin axis. Polar migration, change in tilt, and change in spin rate. Now, let's talk about 701 B.C., according to what the computer model would have predicted. Uh, uh, on the 20th of March in 701 B.C., about two hours after sunrise at 8 a.m., um, well, see, mathematically, it's just after Saturday. We see coming out of the sun about that time, Mars with its dark side to the Earth, but a very thin crescent, extremely bright. It's gradually overtaking the sun on an inside flyby. At, the mid at about 6 p.m. in Palestine, it would be at about 70,000 miles. It would appear about 50 times the size of the moon in area. Okay? It would, about 8 p.m., start to be diminishing. It would have start going further away. By this time, you'd see three-quarters of it as a crescent. This is at night. It'd be pretty bright. It's reflecting the sun, of course. We'd see about 80-foot crustal tides. Bolot, we, would be, have, we will have entered, in anticipation, both before and after, the magnetic sheath around Mars, which is carrying all this debris, asteroids, probably from a fragmented planet called Electra, which is speculated mathematically there's a missing planet, and they think it broke up because... When two of these things get within certain radii of each other, the gravitational uh, poles will fractionate one of them, and they think that's what happened to uh, to uh, to a planet which they arbitrarily call Electra. But the point is, these these bolides and meteors uh, enter the Earth about 33,000 miles an hour, and cause all kinds of interesting things to happen. About five and a quarter days are picked up uh, uh, on the Earth's orbit. Seventy percent of that's uh, of the uh, of the uh, of that is from orbital expansion and about 30% due to spin rate increase and so on. And this gets into a whole discussion of the, the sundial of Ahaz, which shows up in 2 Kings 20. I won't take the time now. It ends up, oh, by the way, excuse me, about of the five and a quarter days, about three and a half to four days are counted by this pass-by alone. Now, the earlier pass-bys probably added a day or two, but it wasn't off enough to really get everybody shook up. Are you with me? total of five and a quarter end up being needed before it's all over. 
Now, uh, we know the most about the one in Isaiah because it's 701 B.C. It's most recent and best documented in, in a variety of ways, uh, custom, as I say, accompanied with tidal waves and what have you. As we go back through history, uh, biblical history, uh, the ba- further back we go, the less certain we are other than the, the, the computer model dating. And what um, they have done at some length is to try to integrate the evidence from not only the scriptures but the Talmud and the rest and they can pretty well, the long day of Joshua appears to have occurred on October 25th, and if it ha- and, and probably 1404 BC. Now, what's interesting here too, by the way, before we leave this idea, is to talk about the Phaeton myth. There is a strange myth in Greek mythology, in the case of Phaeton, and uh, there is the same myth among the Maori tribes in New Zealand. And the Greeks called him Phaeton, he's the son of Helios in their structure, and he was responsible for a chariot they called the sun. In, uh, in Maori legends, the guy's name is Maui. Probably, I guess it's the same name after the island of Maui, but that's all another issue. But th- the story, the Greek mythology has Phaeton, uh, who's the son of Helios. He wants the car. Hey, Dad, can I drive the car tonight? Okay. He talks Helios up against his better judgment to take the chariot of the sun, wraps his hand so he won't get scorched, takes over the chariot of the sun, and as he starts driving it through the zodiac, he loses control. The steeds go out of control. They bang a couple of, against a couple of constellations. And Zeus, seeing that unless he did something, he's going to scorch the earth and destroy it, strikes him dead with a thunderbolt. And from that point on, Helios never let uh, someone take the car out again. Now, in this whole legend and in, in the folklore of the Greek mythology, this Phaeton myth has been much studied by the cosmologists because they be, there's some in the details that I'm sparing you of the of the met legend as to which constellations he bumped into and so forth. There's a striking similarity to the time of Joshua and the day of the of the sun and so forth. Where incidentally, according to their model, it isn't that the Earth reversed its rotation as Velikovsky suggests, which is a bit extreme. They point out that all you have to do is adjust the spin axis a little, and it lengthens the day that Joshua talks about. And uh, so, uh, as, 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 a, as a piece of, of uh, thing. Now, some of you are probably saying, Chuck, that sounds kind of interesting, but boring. Because um, who you can't really believe that Mars came that close to the Earth. I mean, that's all sort of, it's cute. I, incidentally, as an aside, so you sort of know where I'm coming from, I think there's so much that they have discovered and tied together in the model. I think the models probably has a lot of credibility. But I'm also beneficiary of something else that I haven't shared with you yet. Uh, how many of you know the uh, uh, Jonathan Swift and Gulliver's Travels? Have you all remember Jonathan Swift and Gulliver's Travels? You probably never realized how valuable that book would be to you tonight, but tonight I'm going to share some things with you. <laughs> Jonathan Swift was an Irish wit or satirist. He published a series of stories, fiction stories, that he, the travels of Lemuel Gulliver, and he goes to all these interesting places. And most of us remember Lilliput, the little place of the little tiny people. But there's a, a, a place called Putin where Gulliver travels. And uh, what Gulliver uh, discovers there is that the astronomers in this land, described in Gulliver's travels, make fun of the Earth because they've discovered the two moons of Mars. And in the story of Gulliver's travels, uh, these guys mention the size and the orbits and the details of the two moons of Mars. And um, now, uh, what's interesting here is they don't get them quite right, because by today's astronomers, they'll tell you that actually uh, um, um, Phobos, Phobos and Deimos are the two, two uh, uh, satellites, the two satellites of Mars. Uh, Swift said they were about 12,420 miles, in effect, and they, we now know they're only about 8,000. Uh, uh, Swift said they had a 10-hour period around Mars, but we now know it's actually 7 hours and 39 minutes. Uh, Deimos, which Swift said was about 20,700 miles, in effect, we now know is actually 16,670. And he said the p- period was about 21 and a half hours in the opposite direction of the previous one. We now it's actually 30 hours and 18 minutes in the opposite direction of the previous one. So Swift was a little bit off. But let me tell you some interesting things. Swift published Gulliver's Travels in 1726. You might just remember that date. The telescope was invented by Galileo in 1610. Okay? And he discovered with that telescope in 1610 four moons of Jupiter. Pretty neat, because they're pretty bright and pretty conspicuous. Uh, 
He also discovered Saturn's rings. Now, this is 1610, essentially. We can move along to about 1781, when Sir William Herschel discovered Uranus. 1787, where he discovered the two moons of Uranus. In 1789, where he discovered the two moons of Saturn. Lavier, in 1846, discovered Neptune and its moon Triton. Now, recognize 1610 is a telescope invested, uh, invented. Jonathan Swift writes and talks about the two moons of Mars in 1726, right? It's some 50 years or more later that Herschel discovers Uranus and their moons and so forth. 1846, which is, what, 120 years after Gulliver's Travels, he discovers Neptune, it's one moon. It's not until 1877, 151 years after Jonathan Swift published Gulliver's Travels, that a guy by the name of Asaph Hall in 1877 shocks the world by using the staff of the United States uh, uh, Naval Observatory uh, with a 15-year-old telescope that was pretty hot stuff in those days to some extent. He discovers the two moons of Mars. And the world is in shock because all the textbooks said Mars had no moons. They said that for, you know, uh, more than a century. Now, why was it so hard to find the two moons of Mars? Well, Phobos is actually only eight miles across. It has only a 5% albedo, which means its reflectivity to sunlight is very little. It's the darkest thing in the solar system. It doesn't reflect much light, and it's very small. It's also fairly close to Mars. Um, it's one one-hundredth the width of the moon, I believe. The Deimos, uh, incidentally, Phobos and Deimos are named Fear and Panic. The reason they are is fear and panic were the, the, the companions of the god of Mars in the ancient mythology. Um, now, as I point, I went through the numbers how Swift was not quite right and modern. Now, what's interesting about this, you start scratching your head and say, well, wait a minute. How did, did Jonathan Swift know that Mars had two moons at all, 150 years in advance? Did he have a telescope? Well, he could have had Galileo's. But if he did find something, wouldn't he have reported it to the Royal Society rather than just write it as a piece of fiction in his folklore, okay? And uh, uh, why would uh, uh, people like Sir William Herschel and all, the, all the, the astronomical world in those days be blind to the fact that there were two moons in Mars? They all knew there weren't because they'd look and not see any. So the real question is, is how did Jonathan Swift know that Mars had two moons? It's clear as you re read the Swift record although slightly corrupted, somehow there was knowledge available to Swift that Mars had two moons. They went counter to each other, and they were approximately those orbits and, so, and spins, right? Um, the only rational answer is that Swift was drawing on some records from earlier folklore that had to have its origin in an eyewitness account. If Mars was close enough to see these with the naked eye, it would be like 70, 80, 90,000 miles away. And the Jonathan Swift Gulliver's Travel document turns out to be one of several uh, corroborations, if you will, to the idea that the planet Mars was at one time close enough to the planet Earth that its moons, very difficult to see, were visible to, the, to an eyewitness. And somebody in one of these catastrophes wrote down enough to get a feeling for their size and period. The period estimates are amazing. They're, you know, they're surprisingly close. Um, and that record, corrupted though it may have been, was a piece of folklore that Jonathan Swift could draw upon to, to, you know, put his tongue in his cheek and, and color his satire, which Gulliver's Travels, of course, is a satire on, on, on man and his institutions and so forth. So, um, I think that's kind of an interesting thing. As I look at all of this, and try to synthesize it. Sure, it expands my view of what the Bible's all about, because it makes me a little less uncomfortable with the long day of Joshua, and we'll come back to that in here before we close. But something else just comes home to me. You know, we look at these guys in their ancient cultures, and um, they're abstractions. They're little, uh, they're records on, on cute Egyptian monuments, or they're, they're, they're sort of unreal people we read about of so many thousands of years ago. Can you imagine these guys living in a world where nothing is certain? Can you imagine them knowing from their records and from their histories and from their folklore that about every 108 years, something weird can happen, heavy, 
um, building cities. It ain't permanent because the entire cities get wiped out every 108 years or so. Um, and as those that saw it or read the records of their grandparents who saw it or what have you, hear these records of how Mars comes up out of the sun and appears in a matter of a day, comes and goes, where it's 50 times larger than the moon and it's accompanied by lightning bolts, volcanoes, eruptions, tidal waves, meteor showers that land and kill people, bolides that explode and wipe out entire countrysides, all associated before, during, and after the near miss, and that this becomes a repetitive thing. The belief that these guys have, but I don't think it's been proved, is that Stonehenge may do more than just predict solar eclipses. That it may, its real purpose may have been to try to predict the next catastrophe scheduled by the ancients. There is evidence as they look at it, there's hints, I should say, that uh, the ancient tribes were aware of the cycle, at least to some degree, and planned their battles accordingly. That's one reason they ensconce at different times. Uh, to, to take a city because there's a probability that a catastrophe will drop the, drop the, the walls which would favor the attackers rather than the defenders and those kinds of things. So as we read the, the, these terrified peoples, we can't help but be sympathetic. And perhaps we can be, at least in a humanistic sense, a little more tolerant that they would tremble at the names of Mars or Venus or Mercury or Jupiter or Saturn because the movements of these heavenly bodies correlated with their future their upheavals, their, their victories, their defeats. And as we read these, these strange practices of the Canaanites with Baal and Ashtoreth, obviously we can't condone them because they're blind to the God of Israel who revealed himself as a God who cares, a God who redeems, a God who intervenes in the lives of men. Um, different different uh, uh, scenario. We might turn, lest we totally <laughs> um, take this excursion... Um, without uh, at least focusing on Joshua chapter 10. Um, the, uh, my, uh, Joshua chapter 10, let's just skim through it again. Uh, we did, I think, uh, last time, but uh, we obviously have the Gibeonites made a, a treaty that rattled the five kings uh, uh, that uh, make an alliance in chapter 10. Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, gets uh, his buddies together and they make a league against Gib uh, against. Uh, Gibeon. It's interesting, it's not against Joshua, it's against Gibeon. And so they camp against Gibeon. Now bear in mind, if you, from the, from Gilgal, where Joshua is, which is near the, near the Jordan, you go inland a little bit, there's Jericho, you go uphill a little further, there's Ai, and you go over the hill, and you come to Gibeon. And, uh, uh, the Gibeonites, of course, find themselves attacked by this league of, uh, these five kings under Adonai Zedek. And, um, uh, verse 3, where, whereupon Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, king of Hebron, and to Piram, the king of Jarmuth, and to Japhia, the, the king of Lashish, and unto Debir, the king of Eglon, saying, Come up unto me and help me that we may smite Gibeon, for it hath made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. There's obviously spiritual overtones here too, is that when you, uh, uh, are at, you know, when you have allied yourself with the, with the God of the universe, you can expect that your enemies will align themselves against you. And uh, that's exactly what the Gibeonites discover. And, of course, verse 5, Therefore the five kings of the Amorites, that is, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lashish, and the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up, they and all their hosts, and encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. So, so they lay siege in the uphill, in the hills around the valley, that, uh, uh, and, Gibeon, and Gibeon is up on a slight rise itself. Verse 6, And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua into the camp uh, uh, to Gilgal, saying, Relax! Not thy hand from thy servants come to up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. In uh, chapter 9, they had made this treaty with Joshua. And we as we covered then, it was kind of a, <laughs> a pretty sneaky, conniving kind of fraud they perpetrated. But nevertheless, Joshua made his commitment and they all lived with it. And they made this league and they honored it. And uh, uh, we get right to chapter 10, and they're already calling their trump. They want Joshua to come and, and, and save them from uh, their previous allies, but now their enemies that are encamped around them. Now, Joshua does a remarkable thing. Um, he travels about 15 miles uphill through the mountains with all of Israel in a period of about uh, 36 hours. Because uh, apparently, in fact, if you read the battles of the Bible, the military analyses of this, they're impressed over the march. These guys went right through the night and uh, 
You'd think they'd be exhausted by the time they get there. They really push, though. Uh, so it says, verse 7, So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. They shall not a man of them stand before thee. <laughs> Boy, the extent that God goes to to deliver to you is pretty interesting. Um, Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and came up from Gilgal all night. In other words, it's an overnight crash program. So they march, the whole men of war of Israel march up from Gilgal. And uh, they catch them by surprise. It's sort of glossed over, but obviously the, 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 uh, five, the League of Five uh, Kings against Gibeon didn't expect this. They knew Gilgal was a long way away. They probably didn't expect Joshua to honor it in the first place. And uh, they probably had all kinds of reasons for believing that they wouldn't keep their commitment, maybe because they knew there was some chicanery involved and figured that would nullify it, or maybe they figured they, were, they would spend a, a day or two having committee meetings or what have you. Or certainly, even if they decided to come, they wouldn't make it in one day. So they obviously were caught by surprise. And so that's what happens here in, um, in verse 10. And the Lord routed them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Horon, and smote them to Azekai and Makeda. That's looking ahead a little bit. And it came to pass, as they fled from before Israel, and in the going down to Beth Horon, that's the valley on the other side of the mountains, that they going southward, that they're going to uh, flee. They're just they're, they're 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 shocked, they're surprised, so they're in retreat. They're they're charging down this valley, the valley of Beth Horon. That the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died. There were more who died from hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Hailstones from heaven, meteorite showers, maybe some bolides, we're not sure. These sound like meteors. Um, incidentally, to the extent that we're correct in the uh, Steinhauer model, and that Mars had started to make its appearance early in the morning, early in the morning, just about sunrise, maybe uh, 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 shortly thereafter, um, uh, it all fits because of the, the, the whole timing here. But also, we would be entering into the sheath, the, the uh, magnetic and gravitational sheath that surrounds the, the uh, planet Mars and be encountering the asteroids and what have you that uh, uh, tag along on these orbits. And so it's a, it would be very, very um, cosmologically or astronomically, if you will, uh, astrophysically, whatever term you want to use, uh, appropriate to expect these uh, hailstones. Now, where we get into, uh, I don't want to, make the sow sound like it's just nature and it happened this way. It's kind of impressive hailstones because they clobber uh, Israel's enemies. We're going to find out later in the chapter that all of Israel returns to Gilgal. So apparently, the chapter leads us to believe there were no losses. Now, whether it might have been a few minor ones not recorded, it's possible. But the scripture says all, they, all of Israel returned, so in, in, a, in a spiritual sense, we accept that. That's, the Holy, that's what the Holy Spirit would have us believe. Clearly, though, uh, there is some very interesting discrimination by these meteorites because they seem to be able to tell an Amorite from a Hebrew. And uh, uh, that's better than we could probably do if we met either one of them. Uh, they, they do pretty well. Now, um, verse 12 is the one that gives everybody the, uh, the heartburn. Uh, then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still in the, upon Gibeon. Now see, it's early. It's still there in, in the... In the, in the east, and uh, uh, stand still in, upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. Agilon's over on the other side. The moon is separated um, uh, somewhat uh, in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. And is this not written in the book of Jasher? And so the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hastened not to go down about a whole day. Now, this can be explained, incidentally, by simply the shift of the orbits, by the way. That's not obvious until you model it and play with it. But the point is, by shifting the polar orbits and some other things, that would cause the sun not to set in its normal uh, time. So you don't really, it, interestingly enough, you don't have to have the Earth stopped to have this happen. That's the fallacy that most of us would assume when you think about it naively. But if the polar orbit is shifting and the tilt is shifting, a combination of those can, keep this, can, can extend the day. And uh, now what we don't know is what the day standard, it says, did not go down for a full day. Is that 12 hours? It's about a whole day. Is that four, six, eight hours? Is it hours of daylight? There's all those issues, and I won't get into that here. The the the, the studies tend to hit that head on. Velikovsky does, and so does the, the Steinar patch models. But anyway, uh, verse 14 summarizes it in a biblical sense. There was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Now, the Lord's pretty neat because he anticipated this by quite some time. Because the mechanics that he invoked are, you know, 
put up in advance. And that may seem strange, and yet shouldn't surprise us, because the Lord is outside our time domain. When you have a prayer, you're not going to surprise him. He knows what you're going to pray about if, before you ask it, and he also knows whether you'll answer it before you ask it, and he can have anticipated that. So I recommend you pray without worrying about the time domain. Um, he's, he's pretty neat that way. And think of Joshua at that time, because what the Lord had to arrange to take care of the Battle of Beth Horon was long before, um, uh, you know, um, they crossed the Jordan and long before they were even in Egypt. It was, uh, the Lord uh, apparently uh, put this all together uh, sometime early, earlier. He's, when he goes into battle, he's prepared for it. And uh, kind of neat. No day like that before it or after it, and uh, 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 that the Lord hearkened to the voice of a man and fought for Israel. Uh, we'll pick it up verse 15 on where it's a cleanup. The main idea here is this battle, we're going to discover that in the book of Joshua, we had, of course, the Battle of Jericho, which is very special, first fruits kind of battle, with a lot of mystical overtones. We talked about that. We had the Battle of Ai, which they suffered their defeat, and they repented and corrected it and then succeed. And now we have the Battle of Beth Horon. What's going to happen now? When we get by the end of, when we get to chapter twelve, we'll be through with the battles. At the end of chapter chapter twelve is essentially a list of all the cities, uh, city kings. There's thirty one of them. Those of you that are mystics may know that the word for God in the Hebrew is El which numerically adds up to 31. What that's got to do with 31 kings may have nothing to do with it, but, uh, you know, it's all included in the price of admission. I, thought, I don't know what you're going to do with that piece of information, but I'll throw that. But the point is, is we're going to discover from this point on that the summaries of the battles get more and more cursory. The Holy Spirit has chosen to describe these first three in some detail because each one of them have lessons for us. Jericho has its lessons that, in my mind, point to Revelation very strongly. AI has its spiritual lessons in terms of what it takes to win and lose. And uh, Beth Horan gives us some insight to just how far God will go to intervene on your behalf and mine. But the rest of these battles will be summarized in a more, uh, you know, a cursory fashion as we move in uh, further into the book. But I've taken this time uh, together to really go way out of orbit <laughs> um, to uh, talk a little bit about some of the, th- the the insights we have from current thinking. Doesn't mean they're right. They're not scriptural. They're just observations. But they do involve synthesis, if you will, of information about our ancient color, uh, cultures and histories and events recorded in, uh, in the Bible, but also in, in many other records, too, that give us a suggestion that the earth was not always the way we seem to have been taught. And uh, I think the more we uh, uh, venture into space, uh, when you get a chance to page through a picture book, uh, there are a lot of these around of NASA photographs or, uh, from the Viking, Ranger, Mariner series and so forth, and you see pictures of the moons of Saturn, Jupiter, and whatever. Close-ups. Fascinating. They have pockmarks, just like the moon. And you look at uh, Mars, and you find these large gashes, 2,500-mile valleys that have been carved through by collisions and things. And as we look at all this, it doesn't take any imagination to realize that the catastrophe theory of history, if I can call it that, makes much more sense than some kind of uniform, some clock that's been wound up and been running uniformly ever since some cosmic Big Bang or something. Clearly, there have been adjustments and give and take in these orbits. And it looks like God may have orchestrated these to serve his purposes to uh, to to uh, pace the biblical history. And uh, so as we read the scripture, it's interesting that you and I, with the Bible in our laps, can read a record that's more accurate, more authoritative, more descriptive, more precise than the textbooks that we may have been grown up with as kids or that may be in our library shelves today, and uh, and pr- probably far more accurate than the textbooks that will be revised and put on our library shelves tomorrow, that God himself has spoken and uh, in a way that is uh, transcends man's theories, be they these ones that we've shared today or others. And uh, so as we read this, in my mind at least, as a guy who's basically a technologist and engineer by training, I get far less uncomfortable with things like the long day of Joshua or Noah's flood or what have you, uh, as I realize that the... The critics and the and the people who disparage these tales are shockingly uninformed, and I don't mean just in a biblical sense. I mean even a, in a astrophysics sense. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.